section three, and it's called the Cold War at Home. And so during the late 1940s, early 1950s, this fear of communism, I, I mean, led to a lot of reckless behavior, um, a lot of just extravagant charges against purely innocent people. Um, and I want to start here with a clip from a movie called Equilibrium. And if you're a Christian Bale fan, this is one of his first movies. Um, and, it, and it talks about a totalitarian society. I mean, maybe the most classic example is George Orwell's 1984. Uh, but this is a lesser known work uh, that you might connect with getting into a society where people's thoughts could be regulated if they were seen as seditious. And so I'll let uh, the speaker in the first part of the clip uh, introduce uh, the reasons why these people believed they had to turn to this type of civilization. Uh, and then in the last part of the clip, you'll get to kind of the enforcement related matters of what does it mean to police a people's thoughts. Libria. Libria. Last peace reigns in the heart of man. At last, war is but a word whose meaning fades from our understanding. At last, we are whole. Librians. There is a disease in the heart of man. Its symptom is hate. Its symptom is anger. Its symptom is rage. Its symptom is war. The disease is human emotion. But Libria, Congratulate you, for there is a cure for this disease. At the cost of the dizzying highs of human emotion, we have suppressed its abysmal lows. And you, as a society, have embraced this cure. Trosium. Now we are at peace with ourselves, and humankind is one. War is gone. Hate a memory. We are our own conscience now. And it is this conscience that guides us to rate EC10 for emotional content. All those things that might tempt us to feel again. And destroy them. Librians! You have won! Against all odds and your own natures. time we come from the nethers to the city reminds me why we do what we do it does i beg your pardon it does Thank you for coming, Cleric. I assume you know who I am. Yes, sir, of course. You are Vice Council DuPont of the Third Councillory of the Tetragrammaton. Father's voice. Quite frankly, Cleric, I am told that you were very nearly a prodigal student, knowing almost instantly if someone is feeling... I have a good record, sir. Why do you imagine that is, Cleric? 
I'm not sure, Vice Counsel. Somehow, I'm able, on some level, to sense how an offender thinks, to put myself in their position. If you had ceased your interval, if you were a sense offender, I suppose you could say that, sir. You're a family man, cleric. Yes, sir, a boy and a girl. The boy's in the monastery himself, on path to becoming a cleric. Good. And the mother? My spouse was arrested and incinerated for sense offense four years ago, sir. By yourself? No, sir, by another. How did you feel about that? I'm sorry, I don't fully understand, sir. How did you feel? I didn't feel anything. Really? How is it that you came to miss it? I... <laughs> I've asked myself that same question, sir. I don't know. A nearly unforgivable lapse, cleric. I trust you'll be more vigilant in the future. Yes, sir. Every time we come from the nethers to the city, it reminds me why we do what we do. It does. Every time we come from the nethers to the city, it reminds me why we do what we do. It does. Prosecutorial evidence for ANR 136890. I need it. It was late this afternoon, may not have showed up in the records yet. Very sorry, Cleric. Nothing has been logged and nothing is pending under that entry. It was an item of evidence brought in personally by Grammaton Errol Partridge. Check again. Sir, Cleric Partridge has not entered anything in for weeks. You're mistaken. It was a book of some kind. Cleric. There's nothing. Thank you. He's been passing through the gate into the nether every night for the last two weeks. We assumed it was enforcement related.
Now, that was just one example of what a country under communism could look like. And there were many reasons to fear. I mean, the Soviet Union, at the cost of tens of millions, had turned to communism. China turned to communism. And, and it seemed to be spreading. North Korea, North Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia on the brink. Um, and yet, in the United States, there were a hundred thousand members of the U.S. Communist Party. And there was this fear that all communists were somehow in league because Karl Marx's vision of a worldwide revolution. And the concern was that this was somehow being led from the Soviet Union, that all communists were somehow loyal to the USSR, including potentially those in the United States. The President of the United States was accused of being soft on communism when nations like China and Korea were allowed to fall under its sway. And so he established federal employee loyalty programs. 3.2 million American federal workers were investigated, questioned with no reason or suspicion of their ties to the Communist Party, but merely because they were workers within the federal government. And so of the millions who were investigated, 212, only 212 uh, were even dismissed. Uh, very few people were actually convicted or proved uh, to be of any association, but yet people were being investigated and made to submit to loyalty questionnaires. Another great example is the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, this group investigated communist ties uh, in the movie industry. You know, I want to give a modern example. If James Cameron made Avatar in 1953, he would have been questioned before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Why? Because the enemy was a capitalist corporation. The heroes were a communal society fighting against a capitalist company seeking to make profits. That could be interpreted as communist propaganda. James Cameron would have been potentially questioned under the House and American Activities Committee for possible communist influence in their films. Many people testified. Gary Cooper testified naming names. Richard Nixon was an actor at that time, testified naming names. But there were 10 workers in the film industry, famously the Hollywood 10, who refused to cooperate. And I've got a clip uh, from a movie called The Majestic to show you at the end of a kind of dramatic recreation of one of these actors who refused to cooperate. They claimed that to be forced to testify for someone's ideas was a violation of free speech. But what happened to these people for standing up to the federal government for what they felt was a constitutional issue? They were blacklisted, meaning they were never allowed to work in the film industry ever again. The next example. I wouldn't believe it if I didn't know this had happened multiple times throughout our country's history. The McCarran Act made it unlawful to gather, to plan an action that might lead to totalitarianism. Do you know what this does? It makes it unlawful in the United States to think about an idea, to talk about an idea that might lead down a dark path. Really? The President of the United States, Harry Truman, said this was a violation of free thought. And so he vetoed it. Congress overrode his veto. That's just how afraid people were. That's how scared. And, and that's a, a classic reaction. But again, have we seen this before? The Alien and Sedition Acts, the Espionage and Sedition Acts, Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus. We've seen this over and over. It's a classic response to fear. Why might people be afraid? Well, I've got a few examples for you. I want to start with Algier Hiss. Was accused of spying 
for the Soviet Union. He claimed that he had no such ties to communism. He claimed, of course, that he was not engaged in acts of espionage, and he was caught, and he was convicted of perjury. Now, it led many to, to question, was this conviction fair? Was it just? Meanwhile, Richard Nixon uh, made his career into the political spotlight for pursuing these charges against Alger Hiss. The next case I want to bring up is the Rosenbergs. In 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first atomic weapon, four years after the United States had developed one. I mean, even our best projections had the Soviet Union about a decade behind us in the atomic technology. So how did they pull it off? There were spies among us. Noted physicist Klaus Fuchs admitted to leaking information about the atomic bomb to Soviet physicists. He was caught and convicted for spying against the United States. We had proof there were spies among us. Again, reasons to be afraid. But what we're talking about today is what effect can that fear have? There was a young couple named Ethel and Julius Rosenberg minor members of the Communist Party, small activists. I mean, they're, it's the equivalent of being part of a college club. They were implicated. They were charged with leaking information to the Soviets. And based on nothing more than circumstantial evidence, they were sentenced to death. There was a worldwide outcry against their execution. Publications around the world were saying, let the Rosenbergs go. There's no proof of their guilt. The United States Supreme Court upheld the conviction, and this young couple, with no more than hearsay against them, was executed. Why might things like this happen? There are those among us who stand to profit from fear, who use fear, to gain fame and power for themselves. And maybe the most classic example of this is the Senator Joseph McCarthy. He was a rather ineffective legislator. He probably wasn't going to win re-election and he needed something, some issue to help him gain power and fame for himself. And so he began to attack suspected communists. With or without evidence, it didn't matter. He played on the public fears. He gave this impression that he was some great hero purging the nation of this menace of communism. No one would speak against him because all he had to do was say, you're a communist. And their career would be over, their reputation tarnished. He began to claim that there were communists in the State Department. Why is communism spreading? Because the State Department is doing nothing about it. Why are they doing nothing? Well, they must be communists too. People were afraid. People within his own party were afraid to speak out against him. Why? Because he might call them a communist. He might ruin their reputation too. Now, he went too far. In 1954, he began to accuse members of the United States Army of being communist. And in these televised hearings, it was very apparent that McCarthy was bullying and badgering witnesses, that he had no real evidence to support any of these allegations. The public began to turn against him. And now McCarthy's name is a byword for a witch hunt without evidence. Eventually the Senate condemned him for improper conduct and he was disgraced. Some towns went so far as to forbid speech that might favor the violent overthrow of the government. Millions of people were forced to take oaths, loyalty oaths. And I want to give you an example. Every morning we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Included in the Pledge of Allegiance is the phrase, One Nation Under God. Do you know when that was added 
to the Pledge of Allegiance. It was in the 1950s, the early 1950s, in fact. Why? Because, well, communism is a secular worldview. It's a system based on the separation of church and state because it seeks to improve one's position in the world here and now. Well, we also enjoy a celebration of church and state in the United States, and we feel that is very important, right? But yet, the nation under God was added to the pledge during the Red Scare. Because of this idea, this belief that we could somehow view Americanism as a Christian ideology and communism as an atheist belief system, and that we could pit the two between and against one another. Of course, what's on our money? In God we trust. When was that added? Very similar time period. What was the original motto of the United States? E pluribus unum, out of the many, one. That's our nation's motto. But what's the common response when I ask people what's our nation's motto? In God we trust. When was that added? Again, these, these points are propaganda to try to make it us versus them. And, the, and what's the effect of this? Is that people become afraid to speak out on public issues. And so I've got an example here. This is John, Jim Carrey going to lay it down for us. But it occurs to me that there's a bigger issue here today than whether or not I'm a communist. Bigger issue? Mr. Appleton, there is no bigger issue. Actually, not to be contrary, I think there is. Gosh, I don't quite know what to say. The fact is, I... I've never been a man of great conviction. I never saw the percentage in it. And quite frankly, I suppose I uh, lack the courage. See, I'm not like Luke Trimble. He had the market cornered on those things. I never met the guy, but I feel like I've gotten to know him. And the thing is, I can't help wondering what he'd say if he were standing here right now. You know, I think he'd probably tell you the America represented in this room is not the America he died defending. I think he'd tell you your America is bitter and cruel and small. Trevor will come to order. I know for a fact his America was big, bigger than you can imagine, with a wide open heart, where every person Appleton, has a voice. You are out of order, Even sir. if you don't like what they have to say. Enough, sir. You are out of order. If he were here, I wonder how you'd respond if you could explain to him what happened to his America. Mr. Appleton, you are skating on the very thin edge of contempt. Well, that's the first thing I've heard today that I completely agree with. Mr. Chairman! Mr. Chairman! Mr. Chairman! Mr. Chairman, my client is clearly under an enormous strain as a direct result of the belligerent questioning of Mr. Clyde, and he is therefore not responsible for his comments. At this time, we wish to invoke the Fifth Amendment. No, no, we don't. Yes, Pete, we no, do. No, Kevin, we don't. So knock it off! this. The Fifth Amendment is out of the question. But there is another amendment that I'd like to invoke. I wonder if anyone here is familiar with it. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Mr. Robert, you're out of order, Congress sir. shall make no law respecting... An establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. 
or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. You will not presume to lecture this committee, That's the sir. First Amendment, Mr. Chairman. It's everything we're about, if only we'd live up to it. Let him, let him talk. He's just hanging himself. It's the most important part of the contract every citizen has with this country. And even though these contracts, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, even though they're just pieces of paper with signatures on them, they're the only contracts we have that are most definitely not subject to renegotiation. Not by you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Appleton! Not by you, Mr. Clyde. You will stand down, sir! Not by anyone, ever. Too many people have paid for this contract in blood. Enough, sir! You are out of order! People like Luke Trimble. And all the sons of Lawson, California. Damn right. And they deserve better than this. All you boys do. <laughs> <laughs>